My title is the long one. The necessity of living on fire for God in these end times. We have to live on fire for, for God because these are times of great danger if you're not paying attention. And I want you to go to Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to read verse 9 through 13. But I'm going to focus on verse 12. And then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Father, I'm asking for the revelation of the Holy Ghost to our hearts and lives. That in these last days, Lord, we catch the fire of heaven. We run with that fire. We run with the fire of God to the nations of the world and to our communities. That, Lord, we become nation changers, city changers by the power of the Holy Ghost. So we lean into you, Holy Spirit. We lean into the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. amen. I believe that this is one of the most significant signs of the end times. Number one, in, in verse 11, it says many false prophets. False in the Greek, pseudo. Pseudo prophets. A prophet is somebody, if you take a look at all the cults, there's always somebody that heads it up. Sun Yun Moon. His doctrine was that Jesus never got the job done. So he sent Sun Yun Moon to finish off the job. Uh, whether it's Scientology, Islam, Buddhism, there's always a person, Mormonism. Joseph Smith said he had a revelation. And, and they gather people to themselves. And these spirits that are on them just draw people into their web. And uh, I remember reading about Scientology. You know, a lot, a lot of the famous actors like Tom Cruise is a, a Scientologist. Of course, the, his wives don't like it too much. They kind of leave him after a while. But anyway, <laughs> but you, you study. The guy who put that together was the guy who lived in a boat in the harbor. Just kind of laid back guy, philosophy. He, just, he said, I just started writing out this stuff. I made it into a book. I called it Scientology. He said, I was amazed how it just took off. People are looking to believe something as long as it's not, a, it's not an issue of sin, forgiveness, and Savior. If you get me outside of that, I may go the distance. But, he, but he, he says, but many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. I mean, people love to follow false things because anything that's not about Christ, somehow you get to use, you don't talk about sin and your behavior of your life. But when you talk about God, he talks about your holy life and how important it is. But here's, I believe, of all the signs we talked about, the famines, we talked about the pestilences, we talked about the earthquakes, we talked about the, the war. But this sign, is that too serious? It's up there. It's, it's high, praise the Lord. But this sign, <laughs> I said, <laughs> they went from there to there. But uh, this sign, I know you're closer to heaven. That's okay. Um, but because, listen, lawlessness, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, I believe that's the most significant sign of the day we live in. The Bible talks about iniquity in the King James. But that word iniquity means lawlessness. And it says lawlessness shall abound. It's going to multiply. And he infers that it's not just one person. It's just going to be the mode of society. It's going to be the cultural sway of the day. And if ever we see that is right now. It's like lawlessness is, you, is that you, have, you know the principles of God. In general, you know what God de declares is righteous. But you decide, I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to, I want to live with any accountability. I want to live based on what I think is right, and therefore the Bible calls it a living a lawless life. And if you look around our world today, it's lawlessness. They don't want anybody to tell them what's right or wrong. We will determine what's right or wrong. It's a relative thing. Oh, seriously, it's relative? Actually, it's not. You look at the Word of God, and it is the absolute truth that God's principles will always bring life if you walk them out. And if you go against them, they'll always bring death. But the end time sign is the escalation of lawlessness in the earth today. You know, we met a man on the, in uh, Zambia. 
him and his daughter, they flew all the way from Alaska to be in Zambia. How that? It's a fur piece. Uh, he took six flights to get there. And then an unusual man. Uh, he took his whole family. He was a missionary. He's been, to, he's been to the Marshall Islands. We talked about that. And then he talked about, he was a missionary to Afghanistan. He's in Kabul for five years. And uh, leading people to Christ in Kabul, Afghanistan. And so he knows a lot of the Christians there. And so he was, it was heartbreaking because he's on the phone trying to get these guys out. And even when they were in Zambia, he said, I got the call. I just lost two more friends. I just lost two more friends. He says, because I don't care what the press says. The press has gone silent. But folks, um, if you deal with the underground Christians, you, and you deal with what's going on, like I talked to Bill Wilson. I just texted him uh, last week when I was in Zambia. He was in Tanzania, right? At, no, in Kenya, ahead of me. And he says, we're still working on getting him out. But, but if you deal with the real world, the Taliban is taking people out even as we speak. So there's a lawlessness in the world today, and we look at, I just got the, you know, it hits home when one of our own church members, one of their children was shot, was killed in Chicago. And they said the last five years, more people have died in Chicago than all of the dead in, in the Iraqi and Afghan walks combined. So we've become so accustomed to perversion and to lawlessness, and it's escalating like never before. And it's not just in America, it's worldwide, wherever you go. We were in Israel, and Israel had like a week for the homosexual, and I won't get into what they had, but they had big things blown up. They had, I mean, it was graphic beyond what we would allow in this country, but that's the nation of Israel. Lawlessness, they're going to do what they want, when they want, and how they want. But the world is in basically in worldwide rebellion against the authority of God. That's what's, that's what's going on. And I believe that's one of the biggest signs that you know we're near the end. And the lawlessness doesn't just go to a group. It's, it's on all the media. It's on all the, in any kind of entertainment. It's in our schools. And, uh, you know, I, I talked to Brother Ted, one of my pastor friends a Holy Ghost, spiritual man in Toronto, they're looking to lock him up. Because basically, Canada is a communist country anymore. And he said he's been locked up. He's a spirit-filled believer, been there for years. He says, has a big church. Brother Hagen would go to his church. But they're going to put him in prison. He says, pray, pray, they're going to put, put, put me in prison because they're not heeding the laws of their land, which is don't have church. And it's just crazy. Amen. And um, I'm going to deal with our own city about the tent and... Uh, I, I, I'm just amazed. We shoot a few fireworks off for four minutes, and now the mayor wants to see me. People are talking all about, I'm not moving the tent. It's not going down for nothing. I don't really care. And, uh, and uh, they, you know, they can meet me in court. I will fight you, but I'm not bowing down to you. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it in Jesus' name. I'm sorry. You know, just because you live in Tutti Frutti land, I'm not going to join you. Um, you know, we're... People's their whole life is their home and their kids. Really? That's it? That's your God? You bow down and worship that? No, we, uh, we don't bow down with you. Uh, we, we, just, we just beat to a different drum. But if you know this, that lawlessness, people, and you, you, you don't have to look too far around to find it. In fact, Paul talks about it. If you go back to the book of Romans, chapter 1, Paul talks about it um, in the book of Romans. Chapter 1, verse 28, and he says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind or a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. And this thing about a reprobate mind, it's, um, you notice how the word retain, look at that word. And even as they did not like to retain God. Now that says a lot. Retain means to hold on. They don't want to hold on. But if you're not holding on, if you're not holding on God and his principles, then what did you do? You let God go. Like don't interrupt me with my lawless living with the principles of God's word. I don't want to hear it. They let it go. And they let go of God's principles. And that means they once had a knowledge of God. They knew 
Even though they might not adhere to it, they had a knowledge of what was right and what was wrong. But they decide not to retain it. This is the world we live in today. And now they let it go. And it's, as if you look at 2 Corinthians, I mean 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it's a collective rejection. It's that let, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the sin of perdition. So we know we're in the last days because we know the Antichrist is setting up the world for his entry. And so there's this, the, the lawlessness, which is, it talks about the mystery of iniquity in verse 7. That same book of Thessalonians. The mystery of iniquity. That it's coming to pass like it's being rolled out. For 2,000 years, the devil's been working his plan. And it's culminating, I believe, in the very days that we live in. Amen. And uh, the whole aspect of the control of people with this whole pandemic and the masking. Uh, I mean, I just had to get to Africa just to take my stupid mask off. Because... Um, but on the plane, they're constantly asking you to put your mask on. And even though we know that the mask is a completely redundant thing, that the, that the, that the virus is measured in nanometers, and your mask is in mic micro, micrometers, that means a nanometer is 1,000 times smaller than a micrometer. So now they know this. Don't tell me the sign. They know this. They know this. Okay? But what they want is, it's a placebo effect, control over you, just to come in line. And now let's just come in line, just come in line. Because it is a control issue, in my opinion. Uh, that does mean I don't, I don't want to get thrown off the plane, so I'll wear the mask when I have to. Of course, when the lights are out and I'm taking a nap, I don't. But anyway, <laughs> because I know it's, it's just a ridiculous thing. Um, but nonetheless, I'm just sharing with you where we live. The mystery of iniquity. And uh, Jesus is coming for the church. First Thessalonians 4.17. We will be caught up. We will be caught up out of here in Jesus' name. But he said, there will be, they did not retain their knowledge. And Second Thessalonians said there will be a great falling away. And I don't believe the falling away is just among the un falling away. It's falling away from God. And so we're seeing a falling away even in the church of Jesus Christ, a falling away. Where we don't get the truth preached, we have a lot of maybe exhortation, encouragement, but I don't see much rebuking and reproof. And the Bible says we need all three. You need to be rebuked, you need to be reproved, and you need to be exhorted. We need all three. Yes, we need encouragement. We need to be built up. But let me say something about the preacher. The preacher behind the pulpit, by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. When you rebuke and reprove, reprove means to convict of sin. You've got to convict people that what they're doing is wrong. By, by the word. You don't beat people up. But if you're not in the law, following the law of God, then that should bring conviction. And my son, I got to watch my wife online in the middle of Africa. I'm driving down. You know, we, we had to drive an hour down a bumpy road, and I had, the, and I had my chip from that country, so I, it was inexpensive. So, and I watched the whole thing. Honey did a great job. Pretty awesome. And then I, I couldn't hear all, but I heard most of my sons. I said, this is impressive. Okay, this is impressive. Because he's speaking about the power of purity. The power of purity. And what happens, everything he said is so true. Because in the Word, if your conscience, it first pricks you when you do something wrong. But if you do it again and again and again, you can convince yourself that what you're doing is right even though you're a Christian. Even David convinced himself it was okay to sleep with Bathsheba and take out her husband. He was okay with it. So many in the church, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to sleep around. Doesn't everybody do it? No, you go to hell for that. In my Bible. If you're in open fornication, well, I know I call Jesus. I'm sorry. Your body language overrides your spiritual stand. Amen? But if you don't preach it, then there's no conviction. Amen? And I know, like, I don't do it, every, I don't do it all the time. But every now and again, I'll, I mean, 
I've preached against abortion. I've preached against the same sexual things. You have to preach it. If you don't preach it, the pulpit's got to preach it. The pulpit's got to, you got to, you got to. But if you don't preach it, it's very easy to gather a crowd if all you do is pet their stinking flesh. But the flesh can take them straight to a devil's hell. If you do not allow the, the preaching of the, of the word. 2 Corinthians 4.2. Paul admonishes Timothy, you need all three. You need a reproof. And I know what's so funny is when I preach a hard sermon, like about living a pure life sexually, I know people, I mean, I may have been born a night, one last night. I know there's a lot of skanky stuff going out there. I know. I know people just say, praise the Lord. They're raising their hands. But God knows the heart. God knows what's really going on. Come on. And I tell you what, we had a sound man. He was a sound guy. He's such a nice guy. But I knew he wasn't living right. And I knew this was, he's either going to repent or leave. He left. His girlfriend, though, came down and repented. She said, I'm leaving him. I said, you did good. And then he got mad at me because I preached the word. Then she left him. No, no, no. But if you never, but you can go to a church where you are never reproved of a lifestyle that, according to the word, is wrong. Now, that God doesn't hate you. He loves you. The same way you stop a child from running across the street, you love that child. The same way you should discipline your, ch your, your, your children. Listen to me. If you don't ever spank your kid or give him a, 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 some kind of punishment for what he does wrong, you're going to raise a little spoiled monster. Amen. A little B-R-A-T. And what happens is spiritually, we have little brats running around. I want to do what I want to do. What I no, you're living a lawless life. It's lawlessness. It's, and it's the spirit of the age, lawlessness. You know, we do this undercover. Uh, I just My wife told me about how well it went. And under, undercover talks about the, the significance of authority in your life, respecting authority. And she was telling me, many came up to and said, here's my testimony. When I look at this, I have never submitted my life to anybody at any time. I did what I want to, when I want to, how I want to, so help me God. Well, no wonder your life's having some struggles. we got to understand that this age is a, is a lawless age. Our culture is lawlessness. And it's worldwide. Amen? Amen. So, he said there'd be, a, Paul, Paul said in, in, in 2 Thessalonians 3, there'd be a great falling away. But let's go back here to uh, Romans 1. He says, I'm going to give you a, uh, the New King James says, a, a debased man, a debased mind. A God gave them up to a debased mind, a reprobate mind. That means a, a mind that is now perverted, it's twisted, and it cannot ascertain what is right or wrong because it has run over its conscience so many times that the conscience can no longer say, that's wrong, you shouldn't be doing that. I promise you this, this is, in the church, where what happens in the church, and I, by the, by the grace of God, I will speak the whole counsel of God, and I will tell you what the truth says, whether you like it or not, but I must, because that's the only way you grow healthy Christians. Otherwise, you will get caught in the perversion that's in this world today. Just understand, lawlessness is the greatest sign of Jesus' near return. So when you see all this stuff they're pushing, Upon children. It's total perversion. And they keep lowering the age of sexual cons consent. And whether you like it or not, they're pedophiles. That's coming next. And they're even suggesting that we should allow that. There are people in the legislature have suggested that. I mean, they just, they just throw it out like a test. Let's just see if we can get this to fly. And so, everybody say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, but it says, God gave them up. But really, if you look at the Greek, it's not like God gave them up. He said, God's responding to what you want. God will allow what you want. No, this is what I want. I want to give up God's principles, and I'll do what I want to do. You know what? God lets you do it. Because God will give you the free will. You are a free moral agent, and you can do what you want to do. Understand that there's, that there's something to pay after that. And so, 
He says here, a reprobate mind, a mind that, let's put it this way, is sin damaged. When your mind is sin damaged, you can't think clearly because the word's not in you. And you call good evil and evil good. And that cannot, you, therefore, therefore you can't make right judgments. Hallelujah. And so, this is, I believe, and then it goes on to say, they're, they're going to do those things which are not fitting. When your mind is a reprobate mind, meaning you cannot truly discern what is right or wrong because God's the God of all truth and it's only through the word of God that we receive the truth. But if you can't discern between right and wrong, then your behavior will be flowing out of that mind of yours and you will acquiesce to it. And I'm, and I'm saying this because I have to deal with, my wife sat down and said, okay, here's what's going in the church. A lot happens in one week. I'm gone for one, you know, like one week and oh my God. I mean, but you know what? You're dealing, listen to me, with, you're dealing with behavior of Christians that is reprobate. How does that happen? Because their mind is twisted. Because what they did at first was, was wrong, their mind now has a big old callus. It no longer is sensitive to the fact that you are hurting somebody else. You're destroying another life. And it's all about your own selfish self-gratification. And you somehow justify it. And I hate to say it, it's in the church. It's in the church. It's pretty strong when Jesse DePlan is in the middle of his preaching on a biggest Pentecostal church. The Lord said, you see those couples right there? The leaders of the church, they're wife swapping. So he said, I mean, can you imagine? You're preaching along, and he stops. He said, the Holy Ghost told me that you sleep with his wife, and you sleep with his wife. And, and he said, you need to repent. He said, he said the place went silent. The, the pastor gets up and says, now, Pastor Jesse, you got that wrong. Now, these, the, these are good people. He said, no, I didn't get it wrong. So he said it again. So the pastor gets up. He tells the song leader, sing a song. He said, so while they fiddle around getting, getting the song, Jesse said, th he said the third time, I'm telling you the Holy Ghost, you are sleeping with her and you're sleeping with him. And finally, one of the women broke. He said, you're right. Righteousness begins at the house of God first. But you only get it by preaching. Reproof is to convict. A rebuke is a strong correction with some passion and maybe some anger with it. It's that, no, seriously, of the anger. It's like P Peter was rebuked by Jesus. Matthew 16, he said, no, no, Lord, this is not tell us ever not to be. Because Jesus was saying, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. And Jesus rebuked him. He said, Get away. He called him Satan. Peter. All of a sudden, he's Peter the disciple. Now he's Satan. <laughs> Get behind me, devil. That's a, that is a rebuke. That's a slap. Does that make sense? So somebody got, listen, and a rebuke is said, no, 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 no. You, you need to understand something that for you to live a life for God, you need all three. You need the reproof. You need the rebuke. I do too. But you always need the exhortation, which is an admonishment and an encouragement to rise up above the defeat of sin and capture the victory that Jesus has given you. You can do it in Jesus' name. There's victory over sin. There's victory over your body. You can conquer the work of the devil that's coming against your life in Jesus' name. That's an encouragement, an admonishment. But if all you get is exhortation, you live an unbalanced life. And you won't be living the life that you need to live of purity. Amen. I'm sorry. Life's too short. Hell's too hot not to get us right early. We don't have time to languish. You know what I'm talking about? Just kind of fiddle around with stuff in the name of Jesus. And so um, he said, this will abound. Well, what's the cure? 
The Holy Ghost can change a heart, but you've got to open the door for the him by repenting. You've got to repent. You've got to, you've got to own it. You've got to own it. If you, if you don't own it, if you don't own it, That's why the church in America is basically anemic. When I go to Africa and I come here, the church is sick here. We're anemic. There's, but it's changing in Jesus' name. Because God is sending the Holy Ghost. But I promise you this, we, we cannot play church. This is, I guess I'm trying to say this. The safest place for you is to be on fire. Because it says many, in the book of back, back to Hebrews, it says the love of many is not referring actually, is not referring just to our secular world. The love of many shall wax cold, it says in King James. It'll grow cold. What does that mean? You lose your fire and zeal for Jesus. You begin to flow with what the world is into, and the world is into, is into lawlessness. And so the church tries to accommodate the culture by lowering their standards. Yeah. Are you serious? How stupid can you be and still breathe? Where Pentecostal church is no longer on fire right. because they're trying to lower the standard to accommodate yeah. people. It's low level of living. No, it's the fire that will bring the conviction. It will bring the reproof and, re and rebuke and cause people to rise up into the life they need to live. Are you out there? So it comes, so it comes down to um, you've got to repent. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, if you leave your life open to the Holy Ghost, he will do a work of cleansing. He'll do a work of strengthening. He'll do a work of renewal. And you can be restored to where God would have you to be. Amen. It's the truth. So if you go to Ephesians 4.19, it says, who being, talking about the unregenerate here, but, it can, but you can live this way if you're not careful, if you live by the flesh. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work on uncleanness with greediness. The passion says, because of spiritual apathy, because of spiritual apathy, Let me find it here. They surrender, that's the word. They surrender their lives to lewdness, impurity, and sensual obs and sexual obs obsession. And uh, you can lose the ability of your spirit convicting you of your sin. My son talked about it. How you wear down your conscience and you accommodate things. And you think it's okay. And I know this is worldwide because I read in my Bible reading, Dr. Adeboye, one of the biggest churches in the world, he's always writing in the last two months, he's talking about holiness. And he talks about Christians that sleep around, Christians that get drunk, Christians that get high, Christians. He just, he's constantly, I said, man, that means they're dealing with in Nigeria. That everyone in church has got different standards. So he's trying to warn them and bring them to a place of conviction, which we need to have in Jesus' name. So um, I believe that through the true preaching of the word from the pulpit, that people will rise up to where they need to be. And God will begin to minister the power of God. But to grow spiritually cold is one of the worst things. That's how you get caught up in the world. And so the antidote for that is to be spiritually hot. And say, God, I want to stay as far from cold and lukewarm as I possibly can. And when we were in Zambia, this thing really came to me. My daughter brought it up. And uh, we had our Bible study. And, I, you know, I just can't get away from it. Out of Romans 13, kind of sums it up in such a powerful way. Um, in talking about the kind of life we need to live and the life we need to put off. And this is just the first blush, but we'll get to it later. Um, let's, let's see. 
in verse 12. In the, in this, this is out of the Passion. It said, night's darkness is dissolving away as the new day of destiny dawns. So we must once and for all strip away what is done in the shadows of darkness. Removing, ooh, I like this. Removing it like filthy clothes. And once and for all, we clothe ourselves with the radiance of light as our weapon. He's saying that that light in the last days, when the world is getting into darkness and greater darkness, and the, who is the perpetrator of lawlessness is Satan, Satan and demonic forces. Push lawlessness. Push lawlessness in schools. That's the battleground, really. It's our schools. It's you young people. He wants you. He wants your friends. He wants you living sexually immoral. He wants you to reject the word. He wants you to be, you think it's okay to be a Christian and drink and get drunk. You say, well, how do you know this? Listen, I have to deal with pastors. I have to deal with what's going on in today's world. I got to deal with a 21-year-old who goes to a spirit-filled church and one year later, the parents got taken back for a, for a detox because now he's an alcoholic. How do you become an alcoholic? Oh, he's on the worship team of the church, a large spirit-filled church, because the standards have gone to hell because we want to accommodate people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And once and for all, we clothe ourselves with what? With the, with the radiance of light as our weapon. And we must live honorably, surrounded by the light of the new day. Not in the darkness of drunkenness and debauchery. Not in promiscuity and sensuality. Not being argumentative or jealous of others. Now, here's what I love. But fully immerse yourself into Jesus Christ. Fully immerse yourself into Jesus Christ, the anointed one. You know, when we're in Zambia, We, I've got like the first day I read that. It's fully immersed. And so what these, and what they did, I was so stirred up. We, you know, we pray for an hour. They'd pray in the Holy Ghost, but also immersed in the Holy Ghost. And the leaders would go around laying hands on people, and the Spirit of God would come on people. And they'd get drunk in the Holy Ghost. I mean, here's 30 people. Most of them, they're not even standing up. They're either out in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, singing in the Spirit, laughing contagiously. And Daniel DeToy, he's 22. But he grasped the hold of the truth that we got to, that the secret to the Christian life is immersing yourself into Jesus Christ. That's where you catch his fire. That's where you catch his anointing. And it's, his radiance is like light. It's like a weapon against the darkness. So with this lawlessness, and it's a sign of the end times. And it'll get worse and worse. Lawlessness will increase. Why? The mystery of lawlessness is to usher the son of perdition. Who's that? The Antichrist. It's coming. But so but so is coming the glory of God to be released in us. And let me tell you how this plays out so powerfully for me. I'm changing how we do missions. You know, we usually travel in buses, go someplace, we talk, have a good time, may pray some. But the way they do it, they just get everybody so drunk in the Holy Ghost, 
Then they'd get in the van, or the train, there's about 30 of us in this big old bus. They'd just play music, and we'd worship God for like an hour. Just getting drunk and drunker and drunker. Some people could go to get off the seat. They were smashed. Some people, remember that? We'd, we'd walk off the bus. One guy, he's, he, he's out. He's, he'll come to you about a half hour. And I watched Daniel DeToy. He just get immersed in Jesus. If you get immersed, it means you get immersed in the presence of God. You get immersed in the Holy Ghost. You just get immersed. And your little brain, always thinking stuff, can't compute what God does by His Spirit into your spirit. And the power that comes off your life is not your mental brain. Listen, it comes out of your spirit. Healing power does not come out of your brain. It comes out of your spirit. The fire of God doesn't come out of your brain. We need the mind to be renewed. That's the gateway to your spirit. But the end result, it's your spirit that carries the power. It's your, this is a spiritual book. It's all about your spirit. Lawlessness is to get you out of the spirit. Therefore, you're not flowing with God. That's what the devil plans. So you can be an insipid, weak Christian that the devil's not afraid of whatsoever. You're a zero threat to him. You can have a hard time melting sugar cubes. But I watched this play out. Those guys get out of there, and the power of God, we just sense it on us. We saw more miracles, more signs and wonders. And Daniel the toy, just so relaxed, just laughing, on, laughing around, praying for everybody, just laughing. There's thousands of people, as far as the eye can see. He gets up there, he's just so relaxed. Like he's taking a walk in the park. We talked about it. He says, you know what? None of this is about me. It's completely about him. All he wants me to do is get filled up with him and let it out. He's coming to this church. I told him, you got to come here. He's coming week after next. But remember, he was like, he was here at 19. But all his staff, they get the same way. They just get smashed. That's all I can say. I mean, we just needed a whole lot more drinking around here than we have been. We know we have drinking, but we need to take it up another level. And so the anointing grew every night. We'll talk about Sunday, what happened. But, you know, he's just, he said, I felt God on me. In the wheelchairs, he just doesn't pray, just point. Stand up, just pointing, blind eyes. It's coming through immersing in Jesus. Understand that the end times, people's hearts will grow cold. They become cooler and cooler to the things of the Spirit. They're all wrapped up in their head, all wrapped up in the world. All wrapped up. You know, you can be spiritually, you can be intellectually smart, but morally stupid. Clueless. What gets me so upset, I go to Africa, everybody watches CNN. They get their news from CNN. And those who are not spiritually attuned think we're a great ride. In Africa, I said, no, America is toast without the fire of God. Amen. But let me tell you what I feel like for this church. 2022. Get ready. Remember talking about that brother Hagen? Had the hand come out of the eastern shore. And he saw a cloud go over. This is in the 60s, goal of America. A, a shift to make America, basically, we lose our freedoms. We lose our religious freedoms. I mean, they're knocking the door. But this whole mass thing, everything else, is just a push for control. And if they're locking up pastors in Canada, they're coming down here. 
And but I say this. <laughs> Remember that big fireball he saw come down out of heaven? He saw he said, God, is there nothing to look forward to? But the fireball came from heaven. It came with God's glory, God's anointing. And it began to dissipate, jump to those who wanted it. And that fire, they, I mean, sh- they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So here's the deal. We know it's the end times. We see what's going on. We see there's a great falling away. We can see it all around us. But the answer is immerse yourself. Immerse yourself in him. I feel the presence of God here right now when I say that. There is an anointing that's going to come to the body of Christ. The likes of which we've never seen before. There will be an anointing to move like we've never seen before. I saw it in Zambia on this young man named Dan DeToy. But I saw it on all those young people. I saw it on Marcus, Clara. God's loosing people. That, but you got to want it. He won't force it on you. You got to say, Lord, I am a candidate for the fire. I want to I wanna immerse myself. And so I'm, I, we're going to have a, meetings. I'm just going to switch it up. We got a revival coming in November. I got Brother Ted coming back. I said, he said, many churches. I got 136 invitations. I got six churches want me, but because we're friends with Ted, we get him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He told me so many things prophetically. He is the prophet of God for the nation. He said, everything I prophesy, he said, people are coming because I prophesy something, next day it happens. I prophesy something, the church doubles, and then it happens. I prophesy another thing, and then it happens. Because we're living, God is not weaker than the devil. God has the advantage. Amen. And so we got to hook up with him. If we hook up with him, but you got to decide, I'm going to be hot. I'm going to walk the word out, but I want to have his presence on me. I want to immerse myself. So we're going to have immersion services. Okay, everybody, immersed. Get everybody filled, saturated with the power. And what's so crazy? <laughs> what's so crazy? Young people, they might have a degree. Well, most of them are college people, but you don't have to have a degree. But all you want is that anointing, is that immersion. And the miracles that flowed out of all these young people. They'll come back. I I saw three blind eyes open. I saw cripples coming out. I saw paralyzed people getting up. I saw, I mean, you do that for a week, you can't go back to beige chairs. (laughs) You know, little screen, little teaching. No, man. You just had God flow out of you. We need immersion services. And let the Holy Ghost saturate us. 